in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god and when you hear the word from god it will enable you to attain your divine status we are going through the gospel of mark chapter 7 line number 14 and when he had called all the people unto him he said unto them hearken unto me every one of you and understand that is to say in the earlier lesson we saw that jesus had rebuked the priest who were the pharisees and the scribes on having made the word of god of none effect through their traditions and in this manner he had rebuked them and uh, and it's rather interesting hearken unto me every one of you listen to me every one of you about what just as mark anthony in the in shakespeare's julius caesar at the time of the burial of caesar he had made an oratorical statement stating that we are gathered here not to praise caesar but to bury him o citizens of rome that's what he said and here to also jesus is telling the multitude the people around jerusalem and in, and in israel too listen to me every one of you that we have come here to bury the socio religious tradition invented by mortal man to further their own private ends and thereby the priest have made to none effect the commandments of god so 
by their social religious traditions the priest at that time and even so today in many parts of the world they have supplanted the commandments of god and in, and introduce people into socio religious practices invented by them to further their own purpose and it is the socio religious customs which get followed by people but not the commandments of god the commandments of god were mentioned earlier in the old testament in the form of the 10 commandments which are the do's and don'ts of life and then thereafter god at various times that revealed to man to and indicated to him the spiritual commandments or spiritual laws which are the spiritual ethics which are to be followed by man so therefore god initially gave two types of commandments the worldly commandments the form of the ten commandments which are applicable to the entire human race and also the spiritual laws of living which is contained especially mentioned in the sermon on the mount which is a very remarkable section in the gospels and it is that section which is called as dharma dharma means the way of life or the spiritual way of life the noble and righteous way of life which would lead each man to salvation and it is these commandments which have been overlooked by past by the priest by the priest then and even so today too so therefore jesus says listen to me hearken unto me every one of you and understand may you understand and what is it he's going to now tell you what it is there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him but the things which come out of him those are they that defile the man may you understand that from without from an outside whatever enters into a man cannot defile him but the things which come out of him but those matters which come out of him these are those that defile the man and he's going to now elucidate and open out this phrase of his if any man have ears to hear let him hear if if you wish to hear and understand may you hear and understand and then his disciples asked him and when he was entered into the house from the people his disciples asked him concerning the parable so concerning this parable which he had just mentioned that nothing from outside can defile a man but what defileth the man is something which comes from within which defileth him and to this jesus said when his disciples asked him concerning this parable and he said unto them are you so without understanding also don't you understand this do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entering into the man cannot defile him so whatever comes into a man from outside cannot defile him and in line number 19 he says because it entered not into his heart why is it that it can't defile him but enters into him from outside because it enters not into his heart but 
into the belly. So whatever food stuff that you eat, whatever it be, it enters into your belly, into your stomach, and goes out into the drought, purging all meats. And it has its own exist. So it enters your stomach and goes down and goes out and it gets purged out. It gets purged out. And he said, that which come out of the man, but, but he said, that which come out of the man that defileth the man. So he's indicating here that the food that you eat does not defile you. So long as it's eatable food, it enters into your belly and goes out. But what is that which defileth a person? That and that which come out of the man, that what is that which defileth the man? For from within, for that which comes from within, out of his heart, and out of the heart of men, it is that which defileth the person. So in line number 21, he is going to reveal to you, tell you, word by word, what are those factors in human nature which go out to defile every single individual? So from within, within the hearts of men, proceed evil thoughts, evil thoughts, negative thoughts, and some of the thoughts are not only negative, they are evil in nature. That which is evil is that which destroys another person. Scheming thoughts, evil thoughts, adulteries, huh? thoughts pertaining to adultery, fornication, murders, because murders are all schemed in the heart, heart of a person. So these are the things which defile at the man. So wrong, so evil thoughts, evil feelings, evil emotions, huh? which proceeded from the heart of the man. It is these which defileth every single individual. Huh? And, cons and adulteries, the tendency to commit adultery and fornication, murders, all murders are pre-planned. Huh? Killings, murders. So all of these which are schemed in the heart of man, it is this which defileth a man. And then he goes on and says further in line number 22, what more? Thefts. Thefts. So when people commit thefts, there are two forms of thefts in the world. One is a legal theft. And that too is quite common in the world today because people pass illegal laws and call it legal. And there are legal thefts. Legally you steal people's money, property and other things. They are legally stole, stolen. So that's also a form of theft. Legal theft. Huh? Thefts. You know it's wrong, but uh, you have created such laws by which you legally are safe from the illegal thefts that you had committed through, gone through. So these are the thefts. Covetousness, you covet. So that is why it is said, covet not another's property, covet not another's wealth, covet not what belongs to another person. So covetousness, that's something evil. That's something wrong. It's an evil eye. With an evil eye, with an evil eye, you're coveting something which belongs to another person. You have no right towards it. So it is this feeling, the covetousness. So these are all, then wickedness. Of course, people can be very wicked too. When you do wicked things to people, huh? that is wickedness. When you, so wickedness, deceit. When you deceive people, that is to say, when you take, take people into your confidence and then very secretly and quietly deceive them and you deceive them both legally and illegally, you deceive them. So that is deceit. The person trusts you and then you deceive him. That's a de 
then lavishness, uh, lavishness that is to say lewd behavior, bad behavior, indecent behavior which people have. Very often you find that uh, people indulge in indecent behavior, unbefitting, unbefitting a gentleman or a lady. Huh? So such types of behavior, which very often you find people all over the world going through, an evil eye, evil eye, because uh, people have got, some people have got this evil eye. When they look at something which belongs to another person, they want to possess it. Huh? And if they don't get it, they cast a negative outlook on that and spoils it. An evil eye. I remember once when I was in the mountains and uh, there was a herbal plant in the garden of the ashram. And I was alone at that time there. And close by there lived another, one, another woman monk, an elderly woman monk in her 60s or 70s. And she walked in and began plucking some of the herbs, the, some of the leaves on the herbal plant. So I, everybody comes and plucks from it. So I told her, leave some for the others. Huh? Don't pluck everything, but leave some for the others. And lo and behold, in a day or two, the entire plant got withered. The entire plant withered. That was the evil eye of that woman. That was the evil eye. So evil eye, then blasphemy. People are blasphemers. They insult people. It's another practice which humans indulge in. They insult people. So blasphemy is with basically with respect to God, that is to say you are impolite. If you don't believe in God, it's all right, but don't, don't <laughs> blaspheme God. No, just keep quiet. But apart from that, people trade insults with each other. When they trade insults with each other, the insult comes from their heart. Insults come from their heart. And uh, in some parts of the Eastern world, I tell you, these insults are traded so badly. Huh? So these insults and then pride. So when people have pride in them, pride, vanity, arrogance, pride, vanity, arrogance, they all go together. So they are the evil disposition in a person hmm? and uh, folly. People go through their follies in life. There are many follies which people go through because of their desires. Because they want to get something and uh, as a result of that, they enter into a, into a foolish act. Into a foolish act. So that's the folly. Hmm? So folly. And so all, the, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. So all these evil sentiments which come out of a person, they defile a man, all these. So these are the evil things which people have to overcome. So therefore, good thoughts, good feelings, Good sentiments, the reverse of it, they purify a man. They purify a man. But in order for a person to have a noble heart and a noble mind, a person will have to live up to the good commandments of life. The good commandments of life are said to be the do's and don'ts of life. And these do's and don'ts of life are common to the entire human race. There are certain things that one must do 
and there are certain things that one should not do. So when one follows these, then out of this, strength of character gets formed in a person. One becomes a noble. The way to become a noble person is to follow and live up to the do's and don'ts of life. By this, a person becomes a decent, honorable, noble, righteous person. So when a person so becomes like this, then he will have good thoughts, good feelings. And one more thing too, he will naturally have a tendency to worship God and God only. But on the other hand, if people were to indulge, indulge, I'm using the word indulge in all the negative things which have been mentioned just, just, just now, like uh, evil thoughts, adulteries, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, blasphemy, pride, arrogance, foolishness, etc. Then by that what happens is such people will not have the capacity to acknowledge the existence and the presence of God. That feeling that there is a God and a, and a feeling to have reverence for this God comes only to a man. who has acquired this character, who has acquired this character, that he is a noble person in all ways, in all matters. Then such people invariably will not worship and go through pagan worship, will not go into pagan worship, pagan rituals, pagan hymns, in praise of the pagan gods, multiplicity of gods, which are found in the ancient days in, uh, in the Middle East at that time, 2000 years ago, the people were worshiping multiple gods and singing hymns of praise and doing rituals to, to appease and please these multiple gods and erect statues out of stone and wood and metal for these gods. And this is the mythological gods found and they, used, they did worship for these, ritualistic worship for these gods. So these were all worked out by the priest and the elders of society at that time, passed on from generation to generation. But today, even in some parts of the world, still pagan gods and pagan rituals are being practiced by people even today. So therefore, Jesus says, these are the socio-religious practices which have replaced the good commandments and the good teachings of God. So thus, in this section, Jesus is trying to explain to you. That's why very particularly he says, hearken, listen to me about the ultimate, the truths of life and the wrong ways which you have been following thus far for generation from generation. Bury them, leave them alone. So that is what he indicates here. Then, after, so all these evil things come from within and defile the man. And therefore, these are the things which defile a man. Whatever comes from within a man, insulting behavior, wrong behavior, 
being unkind to people arrogantly behaving arrogantly behaving here come at i all of you get away from my way this arrogant behavior out of pride and vanity over nothing over nothing it's still being practiced in certain parts of the world is improper behavior indulged in by certain sections of society even today too so thus these are the evil things which come which defile a person then after that what happened and from thence he arose and went into the borders of tira and sidon and entered into a house and would have no man know it but he could not be hid that is to say now jesus was taking a circuit a circuit during his three year ministry he was going round the area and from the mediterranean now from the from the borders of the mediterranean tira and sidon he was now going towards the lake of galilee so that was a round circle that he was making and in the borders of and he entered into a house and he walked walked he got into a house and wished that no man know it, know it that he quietly entered into a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there but he could not he, he could not be hid but they couldn't hide him but <laughs> they couldn't people came to know that he is there so when people came to know that he was there what happened then at that time line number 25 for a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet and a certain woman who's who's who had a young daughter and with a who was possessed by an unclean spirit came and fell at his feet and the woman was a greek she was a greek a syrophoenician by nation that is to say a syrophoenician by nation they were these were gentiles non jews were called as gentiles be they be greeks or people from phoenicia and other places they were called as gentiles and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter and see if she beseeched him that he should uh, cast forth the devil out of her daughter out that evil spirit out of her daughter but jesus said unto her it's rather now when jesus said the next statement is a little uh, it seems to be a little uh, shall we say unusual for jesus to make this next statement let the children first be filled let the children so that is to say that jesus is indicating that he has come here to minister to the israelites to the jews to the Isra to the jewish israelites so let the children first be filled let me first deal with them for it is not me to take the children's bread for it is not proper for me to give you uh huh? children's bread for me to give you a mercy and to cast it onto the dogs and to cast it onto the dogs now the word dogs is is a rough word which is being used there but i don't i'm not sure whether jesus ever used that word and to cast it to the to the un, you can use the word dogs or untouchables gentiles gen, they were the gentiles so the gentiles were considered as dogs by the jews at that time because the jews had such a big pride and vanity that they were going through that live their live they live their life going through their physical purifications so they considered that they should not and do not deal or have an interaction or social interaction with the non jews so there was a cleavage there was a cleavage there huh? there was a separation there and they considered the non jews in a very in a mean manner in a mean manner so it is this that jesus did not 
rebuked the priest earlier. And they said, am I to cast it to the, gen to the Gentiles? To cast it onto the, onto the Gentiles or non-Jews? Because I have come here to minister to the Jews. Am I to pass it on to the Gentiles? And she answered and said unto her, yes, Lord. Yes, why not? Huh? We may be considered like dogs, but still, why not? Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Huh? But the dogs also eat when the crumbs up, crumbs fall from the table, even the dogs eat. So even though we are considered as, uh, shall we say, not acceptable, not proper, but nevertheless be to eat crumbs, which are fallen from the, from the table. So therefore you could also do something for us. And he said unto her, and Jesus said, told her, he now told her, for this saying, go thy way, for this wonderful saying of yours, now you may peacefully go your way. The devil is gone out of thy daughter. That evil spirit has gone out of your daughter. I bless you. I bless you. That the, the evil spirit which, have, which was in your daughter, it has now left her. It have, by, just by feeling itself, by thinking about it, Jesus has, has sent off that negative spirit out of the daughter who was somewhere else. And when this woman, when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. And when the woman returned back home to her home, she found the negative spirit gone away and her daughter was well seated on the bed. Then thereafter, in line number 31, and again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee. Now from the coast, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean coast of Tyre and Sidon, he is now coming into the, the Lake of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And then what happened? And they bring unto him one that was deaf. And the people, when they had come to that place, Decapolis, they brought him one that was deaf, had an impediment in his speech. So there was a person who was deaf and he also had an impediment in his speech that he was stuttering, stuttering in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hands upon him. And the people wanted to just, they requested Jesus to touch him, to touch this person. And what did Jesus do? He took him aside from the multitude. He took him away from the multitude and, his, and put his fingers into his ears. He put his fingers into his ears and he, and he spat and touched his tongue. And he, told, and he oh, oh, told the man to open his mouth and spat into the mouth and touched his tongue and touched his tongue. And thereafter, looking up to heaven, he sighed. And looking up to heaven, he looked up into heaven and requested and said unto him, Ephatha, that is be opened. He looking up to the heavens, requesting the grace of God. When you look up to the heavens, you look up to the grace of God. So even Jesus is now looking up to the grace of God. And he said, Ephatha, that is, Thereafter, he said, be open. Huh? So the deaf and dumb, the deaf and dumb man, he began to talk, be open. And straight away, his ears were opened. And immediately, his ears got opened and he was able to hear. And the string of his tongue was loosed and he spoke and he spake plain. And that impediment, the speech impediment, which was there, got loosened and he began to speak clearly and well. So thus, he heals, he makes all right a person who was dumb, he made him talk. Who was stuttering, he made him talk. And who was uh, deaf, he made him hear. And he charged them that they should tell no man. And he told them, don't tell anybody. But the more he charged them, so much, the more a great deal they published it. The more he told them not to 
publish, to inform others or publish it around, the more they did it and were beyond measure astonished. And they were all very astonished, saying, he had done all these things well. He has done all these things. He, make, he maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to talk and the dumb to speak. How wonderful it is. They were so was astonished. Nobody could do that to make a, a deaf man to hear and a dumb man to talk. Hmm? So this is something remarkable indeed. Then thereafter, Now we come to chapter 8 there, wherein Jesus is going to feed 4,000 people. So in chapter 8 is opened out in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them. So in those days, wherever Jesus was, the multitude was very great indeed. And he was now staying in a, in a desert-like region. And uh, the multitude did not have anything to eat. They had nothing, having nothing to eat. Jesus called his disciples unto him and said unto them, and he called the disciples around and told them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And this multitude was there listening to Jesus, being beside Jesus, being around Jesus, listening to all what he is saying severing his presence there, his very presence itself, they were severing, huh? feeling benign in his presence. Of course, when he is a Messiah and around him, when people are around, they felt blessed to be around him. So they don't realize, and they were thus like that for three days. Huh? For three days and they had nothing to eat. And therefore, Jesus said, I have compassion on the multitude. I have a great deal of compassion on these people. And if I send them away of fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. For their divers of them came from far. If I send them away fast without food fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the, on the way because, of, because they, have, they have become weak weakened by the lack of food for the last three days. For they came from afar, they came from a long distance, from, from far away. And his disciples answered, answered him, from whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? How can we satisfy these or feed these men from their hunger in this wilderness? How can we get this bread in the wilderness? to feed these people. But Jesus asked them, how many loaves have you? He asked them, how many loaves have you? And they said, seven. They said, yes, seven. And then he commanded the people to sit on the ground and he told the people to sit on the ground. He took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set, be set before them. And they did set, be set them before the people. So he took the seven loaves of bread, gave thanks to God and, break, and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples to be distributed to the multitude to set before them. And they did set them before the people and they began setting it before the 4,000 people. So the bread began multiplying, multiplying. The seven loaves of bread began multiplying and it, it was able to feed the 4,000. So they did eat and were filled and they ate to their heart, stomach's content. They were filled. And after that, they took up the broken meat that was left, seven baskets. And the disciples, they took seven baskets of bread. Of the remaining, seven baskets were still remaining and they took 
And they that had eaten were about 4,000 and he sent them away. And those who were fed were 4,000. There were 4,000 people ate and Jesus sent them away. And straight away he entered into a ship with his disciples. And immediately he entered into a ship. It was a small, you may call it a small, a big boat rather, with his, with his disciples and came into the parts of Delma Nuta. And when he came to that place called Delmatua, once again the Pharisees came forth and began to question him, question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him to tempting him. And once again the Pharisees, once again the Pharisees, the priest, came forth because they want to trip him. They want to question him. They didn't like him. They want to question him. They want to trip him. Huh? And began to question him, question him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him, and they wanted a sign from heaven. Now you, it is claimed that you are, a, you are the Messiah, or whoever you are, but we need a sign from heaven. Huh? He, we need a sign from heaven, indicating that you are the Messiah. And uh, just imagine. Jesus, having done all these things, he had healed the sick, made the dumb talk, made the deaf hear, the crippled walk, He had driven away the evil spirits. He had walked on water, fed multitudes with only seven loaves and five loaves of bread in this is a second instance, and given a remarkable teaching. It is this teaching which they didn't like, and they were envious of what he had done. They knew in their hearts that this is a superlative individual who could do all these things. Then at the same time, they, the teachings were also so remarkable. They knew in their hearts that uh, if people were to accept his teachings, that they, the priest, will be out, put out of commission. Huh? He'll be put out of commission. So they still did not want to accept Jesus. And now they were telling him, give us a sign from heaven that you are the Messiah. Say a sign from heaven. So implying that one, let us see what sign that Jesus can give us. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, and he sighed deeply. In spite of all these things that he had said and done, these people, the Pharisees, the priests, the Pharisees, did not want to accept him or his teachings. So he says, why doth this generation seek after a sign? Why do they seek after a sign? I am here. I am the sign. I am the sign. I am the one who has... Who, is, who has come, the anointed one, huh? the Jesus, the Christ. And still they want to sign after I, he had done all these things. And he said, I say unto you, there shall be no sign be given unto this generation. No sign will be given to this generation. Huh? They wanted a sign and he said, no sign will be given to this generation. But nevertheless, and he left them and entering, he nevertheless, in the Gospel of Matthew, it is mentioned that uh, even though people wanted a sign there, and he had mentioned that no sign will be given 
unto these vipers vipers means unto these wicked people except the sign of jo of jonah the prophet jonah except the sign of the prophet jonah j o n a h jonah in the old testament there was a prophet called jonah who was commissioned by god with prophetic statements to be given to a region and on the way jonah disobeyed the commandments of god the command of god and tried to run away from his command and entered a ship entered a ship on the lake and then in that incident there was a huge storm and uh, he was thrown overboard and having thrown been thrown overboard jonah was gobbled up by a fish by a huge fish and was in the belly of the ship of the of the fish in the belly of the fish for 3 days and 3 nights and that is the and then after the after the 3 days and 3 nights were over jonah the prophet got vomited out of the the stomach or the belly of the huge ship of the huge fish and then thereafter jonah the prophet he went to that region and conveyed the message which god had commissioned him now that was the only sign that jesus indicated the sign of jonah wherein he was to remain in the belly ha huh? wherein jonah remained in the belly for 3 days and 3 nights and then he was vomited out came out he was he came out alive now this particular sign is is going to be correlated to the subsequent sections which are going to come in the ensuing chapters so that is why i mentioned this incident of 3 days and 3 nights he was in the belly of the fish so but jesus said there shall be no sign be given unto this generation to this generation what sign am i to give them and he left them and entering into the ship again departed to the other side then he left them and entered into a ship on the other side thereafter the disciples the line number 14 now the disciples had forgotten to take bread need they had they in the ship with them more than one loaf now in the while be, being on board the sh ship the little ship the disciples had forgotten to take bread and nor did they have any more and in the boat in the ship they had only one loaf left but and jesus knew this jesus knew this that they had no bread on board the ship and only one loaf was there and he charged them saying and he, jesus told them because they had mentioned it to jesus be only one one loaf of bread left with us then jesus said take heed be careful take heed be aware of the leaven of the pharisees and of the and of the leaven of herod so he told them he told his disciples be aware of the leaven of the pharisees leaven of the pharisees means now the leaven is some leaven l e a v e n is an yeast which is used in the baking of bread so he says be 
careful. Keki, be careful, beware of the teachings of the Pharisees and of the laws of Herod. Of, be careful of the laws of Herod too, the king, the king Herod. Why did he say this? And they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread. Perhaps Jesus may have said this because we have no bread. Therefore, he must have just, they took it literally. They took it literally, but that was not the meaning. And when Jesus knew it, because they had only literally taken it, taken it, uh, indicated, because they had no bread, therefore Jesus said like this, why reason you? Why do you think like this? Because you have no bread? That's not the reason. Perceive you not yet, neither perceive you not yet, but neither understand. Don't you perceive, neither do you understand. Have your heart yet hardened? In spite of all my good teachings, your hard heart, still hard, still hard that it can't grasp the significance of what I have said. Even though I break the five, five loaves among 5,000, even though I did produce five loaves, out of five loaves, 5,000, 5,000, I fed 5,000, and many baskets full of fragments too. Hmm? They say unto him, 12, yes. And when the seven among 4,000, and when the seven was, seven breads were fed to 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took, took you up? And how many baskets did you take? Here yeah, they said seven. And how is it that you do not understand that I am capable, that you have, I'm capable of giving you bread at any time that you want? And how could you say that you have no bread? So therefore he says, I'm going to give you the bread of life, not only this bread, but the bread of life too. How is it that you don't understand? Huh? That I can give you the bread of life too. Hmm? So they took it literally and not spiritually as to what it is. And from there, so when he said, be careful of the Leaven of the or leaven or leaven of the Pharisees, he was indicating, be very careful of the teachings, beware of the teachings of the priest. As then, so too today too. So too today also is the same thing. You've got to be very careful of the of the teachings which are given by the priest. Because they tell you to do priestly rituals. They tell you to, they've supplanted the spiritual commandments and instead They put you off track, onto a different track, socio-religious track. So therefore he said, be careful of their teachings. Be careful of it. If you wish to have spiritual wisdom and spiritual knowledge, go to those spiritual minded people who are in the world, the hermits and the monks from whom you can get, you can obtain the spiritual wisdom. That's what he indicates indirectly. Then Then once again, 
in line number 22, it is mentioned that he came to Bethsaida. They came to a town called Bethsaida and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And they brought a blind man and they wanted him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. So what he did was when the, he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit in his eyes, when he had spat on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. Did you see? He asked that. He asked him, did you see anything? Do you see now? And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. So his vision was still blurred. He was seeing people like trees moving. After that, he put his hands again up upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. Then second time after that, once again, he put his hands to his eyes and made him look up to heavens. And he was once again, he was restored. He got, he got his sight and saw every man clearly. It's every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to any, any in the town. But he said, go to your house, but don't tell anybody in the town, nor tell anybody. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea, Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples saying unto them, whom do you say that I am? And this section, we will see tomorrow. Om Tatsat.